In this video, we're going to learn all about correlations. Now, while we won't be actually calculating the correlation coefficient until our next video, we're going to learn all about what the correlation coefficient is and how it works. So let's start with a definition. Correlational research designs are used all the time in psychology and really in any scientific discipline. Correlational research designs examine the extent to which two variables are associated with one another. The extent to which those two variables, an x and a y variable typically, we call them, are related to one another. Now let's go through a few examples because correlational research designs are, are powerful because they allow you to address all sorts of questions you might have about the world. For example, do people who are more creative do better in school? So is there a relationship between creativity and academic performance? Is there a relationship or an association or a correlation? These are all just kind of similar ways of saying the same thing. Is there a relationship between hours studied and exam scores? How about class attendance and final grades in that class? And finally, here's a question that developmental psychologists might be interested in. Are people who have higher marital satisfaction better parents? So correlations are typically represented by R. It's called Pearson's R, named after Carl Pearson, the person who basically invented them, more or less. There are other types of correlations, like Spearman's rank order correlation, but those are less commonly used, and they're sort of beyond the scope of this course. So we're going to focus on Pearson's R, which is by far the most commonly used correlation in research and statistics. So there are two sort of things to think about when you're learning about correlations and when you're interpreting a correlation. There's the valence of a correlation and the magnitude of a correlation. So we'll get to the magnitude in a minute, but for now let's talk about the valence, which basically means the sign. Is it positive, negative, or zero? And this quality, the valence of a correlation, essentially tells you the nature of the relationship between the two variables. So let's take each in turn. A positive correlation means that as one variable changes, the other variable changes in the same direction. So here's an example we kind of just looked at a minute ago, the relationship between how much you study for an exam and your grade on that exam. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we would expect that as students tend to study more, their grades on the exam increase, and as they study less on average, their grades on the exam decrease on average. So the key thing to know, once again, is that these variables are moving in the same direction. Now, notice that even though these are moving in the negative direction, right, we're decreasing how much we study and we're decreasing our exam grade, that doesn't make it a negative correlation. It's all about are the variables moving together, or as we'll see in a little bit, are they moving against one another? So if we're trying to look at correlations graphically, we're going to use a scatter plot, this dot you know, graph that we saw before in our last video. So this is what a positive correlation looks like on the very right here. This is the relationship between the percentage of class attended and your grade on an exam. So this is positive because as the x variable increases, the y variable also tends to increase. And it works the other way too, as x decreases, y decreases. So this results in a line of best fit. It results in a slope that goes up and to the right. And this is how you can immediately identify a positive correlation. So next we have our zero correlation. These are pretty easy to understand. It basically just means that there's no correlation, no relationship between the variables. For example, the relationship excuse me, between dancing ability and math ability. I have no reason to believe that there's a relationship here, and if you told me you were a great dancer, I would have no guesses or assumptions about how good you are at math. And if you told me you're great at math, I don't know at all how good you are at dancing. And so here we have a zero correlation. Zero correlations can be depicted like this. You'll typically see a blob of dots, or you really can't see like a slope per se. It's just going to be a flat line. And this is important uh, kind of theoretically because think about what this flat line means. It means that as x changes in either direction, y doesn't care. y stays at this same point. It stays at the same point. y does not vary as a function of x. They're unrelated to one another. And finally, we have our negative correlation. This is the one I tend to see the most mistakes on, the most confusion about. Negative correlations simply mean that as one variable changes, the other variable changes in the opposite direction. So here's an example. The relationship between how fast you can run and the time it takes for you to finish a race. Think about it. The faster you run, the less time it'll take for you to finish the race. The slower you run, 
chances are it'll take you more time to finish the race. Now notice these two variables are working against each other. They're moving in opposite directions, making it a negative correlation. And here you can find what this looks like visually on a scatter plot. This is the number of beers you consume the night before a psychology exam, and this is your grade on the psychology exam. Perhaps unsurprisingly, as X increases, the more beers you drink, Y decreases, the worse you do on your exam. Unsurprising, right? Don't drink beer the night before an exam. So that's the valence that describes the nature of the relationship. Magnitude describes the strength of the relationship. Now, correlations are values, right? They're ideas conceptually, but as we'll see, they're values that you can compute. And they're always going to be, again, they're represented by R, they're always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. This means, by the way, that if you find a correlation of 37.6, you did something wrong, right? <laughs> because this is beyond the boundaries. So correlations are always going to be between negative 1 and 1, and this value tells you not only the valence, not only the sign, but it also tells you how strong this relationship is, and here's how you can know. Correlations that are closer to an absolute value of 1 are stronger. So if you find something like 0.96 or negative 0.7 or, you know, something as close to an absolute value of 1 as possible. This is a strong relationship that we're talking about here. If you find something in contrast closer to 0, like 0.1 or negative 0.09, something like that, then this is closer to what we would call a 0 correlation, no relationship. So one last note about correlations. Remember that correlation does not equal causation. You've probably heard this before. If you've taken any stats, hopefully this has been pounded into your head quite a bit because it's so important. This mistake is made all the time. People see a correlation between two variables, and because it seems intuitive and it seems to make sense, they infer that there must be a causal relationship between these two variables. Sometimes this is subtle and hard to notice, but other times it's quite obvious, this causation fallacy, as we call it. So I'm going to show you to illustrate some examples of some actual newspaper headlines that made this causation fallacy. I won't go too much into depth about, you know, what caused this and what's actually going on. I'll kind of let you make your own guesses, but they're kind of interesting. So here's one. Low self-esteem shrinks brain. Doesn't seem very likely, right? Probably a third variable here and for many of these. Housework cuts breast cancer risk. That's interesting. I had no idea that, you know, pushing around a vacuum would have this sort of medical benefit. Wearing a helmet puts cyclists at risk, suggests research. Again, I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but it's always uh, fun to see stuff like this. Winning the World Cup lowers heart attack deaths. And perhaps my personal favorite, eating fish prevents crime. Excellent. Again, think to yourself about why you might find this correlation between fish consumption in various cities, for example, and the crime rates in those cities. So I want to, you know, take one more step back just for the last few seconds of this video here and mention that although correlational designs have their limitations, like this causation fallacy, you don't necessarily know that there's a causal effect. Correlations are still so useful to understand relationships in the world, and they're often used as a first step. You determine that there's a relationship between two variables, and then you can devise experiments, which we'll talk about later, to then determine if there's a causal relationship between those two variables.